Good. Thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, setting the, the scene. I'll try to uh, give a bit of view on um, <coughs> environmental biotechnology, where it stands, and uh, how environmental biotechnology exploits uh, nature's biodiversity and how that can be used also more in the, in the direction of what you would traditionally call industrial biotechnology. Um, and uh, as mentioned before, environmental biotechnology stands typically separated from the other biotechnologies in the fact that it's, uh, if you grow the organisms on the plate, you get a nice colorful plate with all kinds of colonies instead of a plate with just uh, one clone with all the same colony sizes, etc. It's a diversity we, we work with and which we exploit and where we try to um, um, develop products with. Now that division between, say, pure culture and mixed culture is already an, an old one in, in, in history. And it's sometimes good to look back to that. <laughs> uh, but what is uh, good also to realize to, that it's not only the difference in, in what you see on plates, if you plate your culture, but also that um, for and from environmental biotechnology, the DNA is, is not an engineering goal as it is in synthetic biology, but it's, an in, it's only effectively mainly an information tool to inform what is present. Um, environmental biotechnology heavily focuses and is dealing with the catabolic part of the microbial physiology, whereas most of the industrial processes, they take the catabolic part for granted, it's just conversion of oxygen, and uh, are focusing on the anabolic part, which in the end produces like penicillin. And the difference, of course, in eco ecology-based process design and uh, we see our reactors as kind of host inviting our organisms to enter an environmental biotechnology system rather than a prison where we try to imprison this poor organism and keep everybody else out. <clears throat> the vision is about between, say, environmental biotechnology or environmental microbiology and the rest of the microbiology, maybe around a century old. And my date partly from uh, activities also from Bayerink in Delft who advocated to um, try to isolate organisms by designing a proper culture and where in the times from Koch broad bouillon agars or blood agars were used as a very as the, the medium uh, Bayerink showed that you can isolate a whole range of different for the need of the organism and making this way enrichment cultures and, and pure cultures. There is a, a bit of debate around that time. Also, Bayerink made a similar remark, and this is a, in a paper by uh, uh, Henrietta Cheek in 1905, <clears throat> stating that uh, the pure culture should be only a stage, although a necessary one, in the evolution of a really scientific method of studying microbiology. <clears throat> now, that intermediate stage that we, after 100 years, has not been really left. Uh, all, already at that time, it was said making, studying mixtures of pure cultures, so going to mixtures of pure cultures, which is recently appearing, would be the next step. So that took about 100 years. And then from there, you finally can go to nature, where, of course, the environmental biotechnology biotech sits. <clears throat> Interesting to see these remarks from about a century ago. Now, that focus on pure cultures led, of course, uh, around say 2000, when the DNA techniques evolved, uh, clearly show that there's a big plate uh, count anomaly. In general, there are way more cells present in soil, wastewater, uh, wherever you look, than what you find on a typical plate. And, or if you look under the microscope, this fish, or just look to the DNA sequences present, there's much more diversity. That led then to the fact that maybe we don't understand 99% of all microbiology because we can culture only 1%. My vision there is this is a bit overestimating because in the end it's metabolic diversity which is relevant. And a lot of the metabolic diversity we can already cultivate, although still almost every year there's really a new type of metabolism disclosed or new type of organisms with very different physiology discovered. So we're still not uh, full understanding everything. For the environmental bi uh, microbiologists, uh, one of the students from uh, Bayerink took that selection principle a bit further and uh, not set the medium, but the environment in the end selects. 
And that's also pointing the real difference. If we design a process in the environmental biotechnology, we think about what we want, why the organism get a competitive advantage, design the reactor around it, and in that way, select for um, the, 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 the activity. We don't select for an organism, we select for, for activity. And we, in general, might not care too much which nitrifier is there, as long as ammonia is oxidized, to say it a bit simple. Um, the biggest difference there is, and that is a part which is uh, due to the lack of due to the focus on pure cultures almost entirely missed in the microbiology is that wherever you are in nature it's a dynamic system also in a way for a chemo plant it's a dynamic system it's not a constant fat chemostat or a batch uh, process it is sometimes there's food sometimes there's not food and virtually every organism has um, adapted to it and that's of course you have to understand these principles in order to understand what's happening in a way for a chemo plant but also to understand a lot of selection principles which are based on this dynamics rather than on the RS, uh, RK strategy, which is so, still dominant in, in microbial ecology thinking. This is also of highly relevant because bacteria which are in, in large-scale industrial fermenters also undergo gradients, not maybe in a day-night cycle, but at least on the minute uh, side, that when they reside in the inlet part of the reactor, see high glucose concentrations, and a few seconds later, the glucose is gone for, for a while. And they also experience this dynamics, and that also influenced their physiology, and that's only recently getting more and more recognized. Now, if you look to environmental biotechnology, it's typically a service-oriented um, activity. That's providing the service of treating wastewater, remediating uh, soil, etc. Um, and uh, essentially, it's enhancing the natural cycle of elements which are brought in imbalance by human activities. And that's counteracted by then enhancing the part of the, the cycling back to the, the, the elements. Um, there are a lot of new areas developing where environmental biotechnology is used. <coughs> and that's that not only is a difference in processes, maybe not that even that much, but in how in the end the product is used because it, in the end it's often not a service anymore, but the product is going to be produced. Currently, it's very often certainly there was resource recovery from wastewater, a mixture of products and services. But towards the future, I'm sure there will be more and more pure products uh, based on mixed cultures by understanding better what's going on and. Um, the new areas, they are the, produ the production of products. I will give some examples. Environmental biotechnology, looking to microbial communities, etc., is a source of new metabolic capacities and enzymes. I will give some examples. Um, the search of new natural compounds, for instance, new antibiotics or new ways to fight uh, diseases, um, is also heavily inspired or based on looking to natural organisms and how they are handling uh, or fighting with each other, you could say. Um, in, in the health, um, that is uh, on one hand the whole gut microbiology is of course very close to the microbiology of, of wastewater chemo plants effectively, but also it was already there, but with the corona, um, uh, the corona ep epidemic, the wastewater-based epidemiology is popping up, uh, at least booming in the last year, <coughs> and it's likely something to stay. Also there, the, the work with the mixed cultures is relevant. And finally, also in agriculture, you see a lot of attention for plant growth, stimulating bacteria the last five to 10 years. And all these developments, they are effectively possible that you don't need to culture an organism in pure culture anymore. <clears throat> the metaomics techniques are getting so, so strong on all levels that you can actually study like um, metabolomics in a mixed culture in a, in a decent way. You can study uh, proteomics in a mixed culture. So you can use all the tools, which you also nowadays use with, mixed, with pure cultures, with mixed cultures, with maybe not the same accuracy, but good enough to understand what's going on. <clears throat> now, if you look at uh, the general concept uh, we are working on that is trying to convert what is ever is called waste into products. And that's based also on the, on the big, idea that we have agriculture, agriculture can supply 
feedstock stock for the biotech industry, but the biotech industry essentially takes the sugars and maybe a bit the lipids, but mainly the sugars. And all the order organic carbon which is left over is uh, kind of waste. <clears throat> now, part of that carbon is easy degradable. That part we should harvest and turn into products. And a part of that material is very weakly or not biodegradable. That should go back to the land for soil fertility. And we try to convert that part, which is easy degradable, non sugar, in organic waste streams, but also industrial wastewater and municipal wastewater. And, a, and the easiest way to do that is use a refinery concept where you try to convert most of that compounds into volatile fatty acids by a traditional fermentation, very high yields, and then convert the PFAs either into storage polymers, methane is still here on the list, extracellular polymers, long chain fatty acids is an interesting development here, and uh, proteins are also considered as a feasible option. And there will be more, this is just an initial list. Um, <clears throat> now, examples uh, where I will talk about a bit that is uh, um, a bit how uh, microbial enrichments can help in algal biofuel production, production of bioplastics, and Chimera. Um, as an example of how you can use the, the principles of microbial selection, um, there's a lot of research on uh, cultivating algae and um, for oil production or for, for the sugar production. And the traditional way is screening all kind of pure cultures on their capacity to do so. You can also evaluate why bacteria would, or algae in this case, would anyway be interested to store lipids or sugars. And then you realize quickly that likely has to do with day-night cycle. And if you put in a day-night cycle and you drive that day-night cycle, not to the 12, 12 hours, but to make it as, uh, to drive to maximum storage capacity, you very rapidly get organisms accumulated in the, in the fermenter, which were not isolated before in pure culture, but which have higher rates of forming storage polymers, in, the, in this case polyglucose, and also amounts of polymers uh, accumulating in the cell up to 60-70% uh, comparable to, to uh, existing pure cultures. And if you give vitamins, they switch from uh, glucose, uh, polyglucose accumulation to lipid accumulation, and showing the power of uh, natural selection for getting optimal strains, um, in, in this case for lipid or polysugar formation out of light and nutrients from, for instance, a leftover of a, of a waste or a fume plant. The other product we have been looking at to is, is a lot is polyhydroxyalkanoates, mainly because virtually all organisms can make it. You can convert organic waste into VFAs and VFAs into PHA. Now that PHA can be used for many different applications. So that was a reason to look to PHA, the versatility of potential products. That could be a good basis to convert waste organic carbon into a kind of a valuable product. And um, the, um, the basic background is that you have organic waste, you convert it in to, to, to this and um, create selective conditions. Now, the traditional way for selecting or for getting high PHA is somehow inhibiting growth. For most organisms, they do not, in nature, they don't store PHA because they are inhibited in growth, but they are simply uh, experience a feast famine regime. They sometimes have food and sometimes they don't have food. And when they don't have food, they can either uh, decide where to perish or to, when they have food, store some material and use that in the periods there's no food as their food and have a much more balanced growth. And that's what virtually every organism does. And this is also, for instance, a standard response for bacteria in large scale fermenters. They will not quickly oxidize the glucose and then do the while nothing, but they use either polyglucose or also PHA as an intermediate compound, temporarily storing it and um, um, to balance the, the gradients of sugars in, in large scale fermenters. Now, the ecological role you can then enhance in the fermenter by instead of uh, in the chemostat, by instead of feeding continuously, you just feed every hour with a pulse or every two hours with a pulse of substrate and with a big pulse of substrate. And then the organisms which most rapidly 
store the substrate and the rest of the time grow on it will be the ones which, uh, which survive and which will become dominant. And then whatever substrate you use, you each time get a different organism, but the physiology is the same. They take up the substrate, they store it, and in the, when the substrate is gone, they will grow on it. And uh, so the basic physiology, the basic stoichiometry, the basic metabolism is all the time the same for whatever substrate in the end you get, but the name of the organism varies. So you select for the, uh, the physiology, for the conversion type, and not that much for the organism. And then you get, you select organisms which have, say, PHA storage capacity rates of about five times that of reported for pure cultures, and also up to 80-90% of the dry mass in the end being PHA. Now that is at the moment at the demo scale, there have been a range of pilot tests in the Netherlands, but also other places in Europe, and currently there's a plant under construction uh, on the right-hand side in the project PHA to use uh, for a few hundred tons per year of PHA production based on uh, municipal wastewater and uh, municipal wastewater sludge. So that will be the next step in the development. Interesting aspect think, looking here is that if you produce PHA, there is an enzyme involved to convert SA to acetyl coa to hydroxybutyryl coa uh, reductase that traditionally it's, is thought to be an NADPH depending enzyme. Uh, but in <clears throat> quite some organisms, uh, we find that they have an NADH dependency. And actually this shows that PHA is used in different ways. By most of the pure cultures, it is as essentially an NADPH dependency and used for catabolic overflow. So if you stop growth, if you inhibit growth, it will start to produce PHA. But in an organism like Acumulibacter and others, it's NADH dependent, which makes it essentially an anabolic, anabolic overflow um, um, uh, response. And essentially, if you look a little bit, think a little bit better, the, for Acumulibacter, they convert glucose to PHA under anaerobic conditions. And then when a bit later they get oxygen, they convert the PHA into cell mass. So essentially, they have an anaerobic fermentation of glucose to PHA as the end product, and then an aerobic growth on PHA. And if you think then about that, um, that would be the possibility for then, in this case, with synthetic bi biology, because only producing PHA anaerobically has hardly any function. But with these enzymes, we found an acumulibacter. They have an extreme high um, um, activity compared to other known um, PHA um, um, acetoacetyl-CoA reductases, and they are strongly NADH dependent. You can construct an organism which under strict anaerobic conditions <coughs> can convert in the end sucrose into PHA and with the little bit of ATP it gets it can just build the cell to hold the amount of PHA they produce. So it's a synthetic biology um, work in the end uh, where Carl cons constructed the strain to do this um, which then gives the opportunity to produce PHA anaerobically out of glucose and where aerobically you might have only a carbon yield of about 30% based on glucose when you produce PHA. If you do this anaerobically, because it's the end fermentation end product, it's around 80 or 85% of the glucose, which ends up as uh, a, a, with a carbon yield of about 85%. So a nice example of how uh, what you observe in mixed cultures can then be used in synthetic, synthetic biology for generating new products and pathways. Another interesting uh, I want to share is uh, an organism called Galacturonibacter. We were just interested how is galacturonic acid converted in, in mixed cultures. And what we observed here in the, in the recent work by uh, Laura Hart was that we got organisms which had the traditional galacturonic acid fermentation, which was known from Klebsiella, et cetera, to acetate and maybe formate or hydrogen. But this organism integrated the traditional, uh, say, Antrodurov pathway with the Woodlung-Dahl pathway in one cell. And interestingly, this organism had all the enzymes of the, the known Woodlung-Dahl pathway identical to what was known, except for the carbon monoxide, monoxide dehydrogenase, which is a, a different one from what was known until now. And this all the attention for 
the growing organisms on carbon monoxide and hydrogen, it's interesting to see there's more diversity in this kind of enzymes than what was known until recently. And we're looking currently at the differences between the different enzymes. Um, as a final example, this is coming back from the wastewater treatment plants where we are developing products. Um, we developed a wastewater treatment plant system based on granular sludge, which has a main advantage. It's much more simple wastewater treatment, much more compact, only about 25-30% of the space needed with lower investment cost and lower energy. So this treatment plant gets introduced quite quickly worldwide. And the bacteria, they make a a gel, a hydrogel, in order to make these granules. Now, that hydrogel that has properties a bit similar to alginate. Now, currently, there are about 70 Nereda wastewater treatment plants in operation of these in the worldwide. If you would extract the polymers from all these 70 plants, you would have more alginate, double the amount of alginate than what's currently already on the market. And the number of treatment plants is strongly increasing currently. So this is an interesting product we can make out of a wastewater treatment because Hydrogels are in general market supply limited and not very well explored. So what we're doing is now extracting the polymers from um, the, the waste active, the waste granular sludge from these treatment plants. These, we call them Chimera to have a, a kind of recognizable name. It's, it, the polymers are not alginate. They, they behave like that, but they're not the same. And there's an extraction facility for about 500 tons per year uh, operation at the moment and the first uh, material uh, brought on the market. Now, the interesting of this material is that it has a wide range of applications. Current uses mainly as plant growth stimulation and binder for making uh, fertilizer pellets and seed coatings. So we can make composite materials out of that. On the left top corner, you see a composite of Chimera with uh, cellulose, which has say same properties as shells and the same aspect as shells, they, they are as shiny. You can make them also with clay. Then you make composites, which have a much higher stiffness than the known composites, um, and with much higher inorganic fractions. And besides that, they have a very high stiffness, which means them, which makes them interesting as material in construction. Uh, they also have non-flammability. On the top, bottom left, you see one of our flammability tests. There's about... Um, up to 1,000 degrees uh, or 1,500 degrees, uh, there's no flame forming. It's jarring, but it's not, not flaming. And it has a heat shield effect, which is stronger than the heat, heat shields which are used on the rockets which come uh, down to Earth. So in this case, there's about uh, uh, what was it, uh, 300 degrees Celsius gradient over a distance of on, only 100 microns, uh, 200, yeah, 100 micrometers. Um, so there's a versatile range of applications we're looking at, and what's also nice with this material, we can show that yeah, what, what you put to, through the toilet might in general be disgusting, but you can make material out of it which looks like that you want to buy it, and which is, even if you know that it's made out of toilet flushing, not immediately saying, well, I don't need it. Um, showing that resource recovery and using waste is not something to, which ends up in low quality products. So to conclude, um, so the metaomics technologies have opened the black box of microbial ecology, makes it possible to study every organism in a system, not only those which, which are happy to grow on a plate. Um, the environmental biotechnology will probably go at least for a part from a service-oriented industry to a product-oriented uh, uh, activity. And uh, what is all observed in the environmental biotechnology gives inspiration and potential for novel industrial microbial approaches. And thank you for your attention. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with everyone today and uh, to discuss uh, some of, I, I would say, sort of my, my thoughts, um, definitely from an engineer's point of view on um, challenges as well as opportunities in industrial uh, biotechnology. And so <clears throat> to, to sort of jump straight in, you know, I, I wanted to just first, uh, um, you know, in looking through the, uh, the list of folks who are participating in uh, IBISPA, I, I wanted to just put a few caveats to some of my remarks. Um, 
Uh, first, I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. I'm not a biologist. Um, I do not know how to grow organisms. My PhD was in statistical mechanics myself, so I am definitely not a, uh, <laughs> um, I, I come at this much more from a process engineer's perspective uh, and, and definitely I'm not a, not a biologist. And so I, I'm not, I'm gonna omit massive swaths of, you know, sophisticated synthetic biology tool development, which of course is incredibly important in this field, obviously. And uh, frankly, many of you are way more expert in that space than I am, and, and, and thus my omissions of those sorts of things in my remarks. And my motivations are, are squarely in, um, you know, from a process engineering perspective, using industrial biotechnology as a tool to make essentially realize the bioeconomy realistically and at scale and cost effectively and sustainably. And then um, the other thing I wanted to note is that uh, uh, the examples that I'm going to use today are, are quite limited. Of course, I, I fully realize this is a huge global community of which we're all part of, but um, I'll use a lot of examples from our own group's work simply just for convenience um, or efficiency or laziness, whatever you want to call it. So, and then um, I will also note one thing and, and really enjoyed Mark's comments and, you know, my, our, our group does essentially, you know, almost almost all of our work squarely in the monoculture space, not microbial consortia. And so, um, but I think that we, we do leverage information from and, and learnings from environmental microbiology, uh, but we don't do work in that field specifically. And I'll show you a few examples where I think we are leveraging those things. And so in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of sort of the topics that I'll, I'll cover today, um, you know, we really, uh, you know, I'll focus on um, sort of this this idea of pairing substrates and products uh, from a bioeconomy perspective. I think, um, you know, we, we tend to focus a lot on sugars as a community, of course, uh, but there are so many other substrates out there. Um, Mark just talked about some of them that are that are quite valuable and important, and we have to be thinking, thinking through, of course, many of us are in the context of the circular uh, carbon economy. And pairing substrates and products, I think, is, is a really important thing from a yield perspective and a Again, realizing biotechnology at scale. I'll talk about hosts as well. I'm a big fan of uh, non-model microbes and going with nature's best uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a process context. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about tools, um, specifically around things that, that are relevant and, and work we're doing in the space. And then I'll talk a lot about processes at the end. Um, and I, I just wanna point out here that, you know, we shouldn't forget about everything else besides just the microbe piece, because there's a lot of other things that we need, other pots and pans figuratively that we need to make work uh, to be able to, to realize biotechnology at scale. And so, you know, you know I, I won't belabor this slide much, but uh, I think everybody knows this, of course, but, you know, the, the most traditional substrates to my knowledge, at least uh, in the industrial biotechnology space are, are really things like uh, sugar cane shown on the left here. Uh, or sugars derived, I should say, from sugar cane, uh, glucose, sucrose, et cetera, uh, sugar beets, and other other types of, um, you know, so so called first generation type crops, as well as as well as some lipids uh, from oil crops as well, and and many uh, you know sort of successful scaled up biotechnology applications that use monocultures or or sort of uh, you know close to monocultures, what I is what I would call that, um, you know, uh, use these first generation uh, sugar feedstocks and. And you know, there's obvious exam, uh, you know, exceptions. Anaerobic digestion, of course, is at massive scale, practiced at massive scale around the world today. And ethanol production, say in Brazil, for example, is practiced with wild yeast. Uh, and essentially, they acidify the bacteria out of that uh, uh, in, in small recycle loops, sort of on the uh, uh, side saddle on the fermenters. Um, and then, you know, of course, I would say at least in North America, you know, I, I think this is perhaps different in the EU, but. Um, you know, there's very little incentive today to use lignocellulose at sugars or generally lignocellulose at scale, uh, at least for industrial biotechnology applications, but hopefully that will change. Um, and I, but I, but I really want to point out, you know, going beyond those sort of first generation feedstocks, you know, industrial biotechnology, in my opinion, is insanely powerful in the context that it can handle well beyond, you know, uh, simple first generation sugars uh, from a substrate perspective, including um, you know, uh, other types of biomass derived or agricultural waste species, lignin included, um, wastewater from industrial manufacturing uh, and waste streams generally from industrial manufacturing, uh, even brown coal. We have uh, projects going on uh, with colleagues in Australia and Germany around uh, oxidized brown coal, which is essentially very similar, frankly, to lignin uh, and plastic waste and fats, oils and greases and other types of things. And these, um, to me, the one of the beauties of biology is selectivity in the face of diverse uh, carbon feedstocks. And again, I think that's where environmental sort of microbiology really, really shines. <clears throat> and 
and I'll, I'll, I'll show a few examples of, of sort of harnessing this from, from our work. Again, there are many others who work in this, all of the same spaces I'll show, as well as um, you know, many other examples out there. Uh, one, one is around this idea of lignin valorization through, through a microbe, essentially. So lignin is a heterogeneous uh, uh, alkyl aromatic polymer that essentially makes plants stand up or allows plants to stand up. Um, there are, you know, there's literally more than a century of literature out there on how to break it down. And in all cases, because you start with a heterogeneous substrate, you end with a heterogeneous mixture of small molecules. Um, and sort of, I, I think my first foray into even acknowledging or realizing that environmental microbiology was a field um, at, at any more detail level than simply those two words together um, was, was really finding this paper from Nature Reviews uh, Microbiology in 2011, where essentially, um, you know, these, these authors basically said that nature has already figured all of this problem out, how to deal with this heterogene heterogeneous mixture of aromatics. And for us, from a biotechnology perspective, we started towards this idea of using this biological funneling concept to be able to take heterogeneous uh, aromatic compounds from lignin and, and be able to funnel those down into single molecules such that we can overcome this heterogeneous uh, sort of heterogeneity problem of lignin by making single molecules uh, from this heterogeneous stream, which we're, which we're quite excited about. Um, and and I, should, I should note many other people, of course, do work in this space and, and, and lots of uh, sort of environmental biotechnology and microbiology was done to really uh, lay the foundation for this type of, this type of work. Uh, another example, and, and Mark mentioned this as well, which I, I really appreciate, is, is the idea of wastewater treatment, right? And so, uh, of course, wastewater treatment uh, using biotechnology is, is typically done with, with mixed cultures, and, and for very good reason, of course. Uh, this is a very demanding environment with many toxic molecules coming in, as well as a huge buffet of, of carbon for, for organisms. But uh, we had this crazy idea several years ago of potentially using uh, highly engineered monocultures to do wastewater treatment, specifically in the context of thermochemical biorefining for biomass, which produces ketones, acid, aromatics, aldehydes, and alcohols. Uh, and we've been engineering, for example, Pseudomonas putida, KT2440, which is an organism that we really fell in love with several years ago, um, to be able to you know, consume many of these um, molecules simultaneously and you know, put in many tens of KB of heterologous DNA to be able to do that. And, and, and but there's, there's obviously opportunities for microbial consortia to overcome toxicity, enable catabolic potential and, and really an engineer uh, product uh, sort of production. Uh, and, and a third example is, which I think is really exciting and, and really um, you know, growing an, an interest around the world. This is again, work from our group, acknowledge that many other groups do work in this space is, can we use industrial biotechnology for enabling um, plastics recycling and plastics upcycling, especially in open loop type uh, approaches. Um, polyethylene terephthalate, of course, is um, produced at massive scale today. This is the most common polyester produced uh, synthetically. Uh, it can be broken down through many different strategies uh, through thermochemical as well as enzymatic strategies to um, the terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol constituents or, or um, for example, this bis hydroxy uh, ethyl terephthalate uh, or VHET. And we engineered, for example, organisms to be able, including Pseudomonas, to be able to uh, essentially process this down to terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol, and then engineered the same organism to be able to produce, you know, valuable products from this as well. So, so I, I, you know, I think that there's just so many opportunities for industrial biotechnology to take, you know, sort of non-traditional feedstocks and, and convert them into valuable, valuable compounds towards the circular carbon economy. But I think it's also important that we, we, we think about from the start you know, when we have new substrates like industrial wastewater from thermochemical biorefining, like lignin, like, um, you know, fats, oils, and greases, et cetera, we, we, we must think about, and, and, and frankly, anybody can do this. This is a fairly straightforward thing is, is start thinking about like MISR, for example, this metric for inspecting sales and reactants. So if you assume conversion is free and you know the stoichiometry of your reaction, you know, whether it goes through a cell or cell free type process or, you know, a chemical, any kind of chemical reaction, um, one can essentially understand directly how promising a bioprocess could potentially be using these really simple um, sort of heuristics uh, as well. And I, and I strongly suggest use of these types of things. And, you know, and, and the beauty of this is, you know, we, we as, you know, simple searches on MetaPsych or, for example, this sort of eye chart here on the right-hand side from this beautiful paper from Sang Yip Lee and Nature Catalysis a few years ago, you know, it just shows really the diversity of molecules that we can potentially make through, uh, through biological transformations. 
And I, and I think, you know, really focusing on this idea of pairing substrates and tar target products, um, there's there's a lot of these things that you can find in the literature. And, and I'm not, I don't mean to rag on anybody or pick on anybody. I just I just wanted to point these things out. I think it, you know, there's 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 some really heavy lifts if you start with sugars to get to certain products, and there's some really light lifts if you start with other substrates uh, to get to, for example, to the same products. Uh, one example is flavonoids. You know, there's a lot of work from many different groups, starting with glucose and trying to get to flavonoids. But if you look at the pathways for these things, they're incredibly long, right? And you you go through uh, uh, PEP and E4P to go to, to the shikimate pathway to produce phenylpropanoids, uh, and then you need a, a malonyl-CoA or acetyl-CoA uh, acetyl to be able to then build flavonoids. Uh, but some really cool work from Jake Kiesling, for example, uh, quite recently published, uh, they said, well, let's just completely circumvent this entire branch of this pathway and start with, for example, PQ mark acid and ferulic acid, which can be derived from corn bran and corn stover and other uh, grassy feedstocks, ag, ag residues, at incredibly high yields, uh, and, 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 and to be able to produce flavonoids or chalcones or other types of molecules. This is a curcumin type molecule uh, in this case. Uh, and, and this is you know, way more efficient from a yield perspective. Um, similarly, I, one example near and dear to my heart is um, you know, this, this beautiful work. This is a really amazing paper uh, in the mid 90s from Karen Drafts and John Frost. Uh, wherein they showed that you know you can take glucose, uh, similar to the last slide, through protocatechuic acid through the shikimate pathway, uh, and produce meconic acid. And then in the 90s, they were interested in then hydrogenating this to make adipic acid um, in a more environmentally friendly way. But if you look at the molar yield, theoretically, it's, it's about 40%. Uh, but if you instead start with again aromatics, for example, that you can derive from corn bran and corn stover, you know, in industrially relevant ways today. Um, now you can go to muginate and essentially 100% yield. And so I, to me, I think, you know, in terms of challenges and opportunities, I think um, we, we, we as a community need to keep sort of scanning the horizon for new substrates as they come on board uh, to realize bioproducts at much higher yields um, and, you know, for, for new applications, to enable new applications as well, as, as I should say. Um, I, and I also think besides, you know, really thinking about the substrate and target pairs, we also need to be very considerate of the hosts that we uh, that we use and, and our hosts should be tailored to the application at hand. Um, you know, for example, you know, the, the, the cellulosome from Clostridium thermocellum has been very well studied both, um, you know, in a biochemistry context, but also uh, in attempting to, to leverage and harness these types of cellulosome context to, to basically put them on the yeast, uh, you know, sort of on yeast uh, surface cell, cell displays kind of things to be able to enable yeast to break down cellulose. And, and if you look at these types of works, and Hui Min Zhao, of course, is a pioneer in this space, and many others have done work in this space, you know, the, the extent of conversion that folks are able to get with cellulose or um, even lignocellulosic biomass is usually on the order of ones to very low tens of percent. But, but if you simply go back to the native organism, Clostridium thermocellum, um, and in this case, this is an engineered uh, version to be able to produce ethanol, uh, you can see that it's an absolute beast on cellulose, right? I mean, it's able to break down 100% of cellulose. This is 60 grams per liter, um, and it's able to, you know, achieve 90% or so uh, cellulose conversion uh, in a fairly reasonable time scale and produce ethanol from that, which is uh, really impressive. And so host selection, you know, we should go with nature's best, as, as Lee Lind would say. Um, but I, and, and, and in that vein, I think that we as a community also have a huge opportunity in the domestication of non-model microbes. This is a, a an image from a paper from Hui Min Zhao, um, you know, where where he he goes through and talks about, you know, uh, we of course need the genome sequences, we need promoters and terminators for non-model microbes and vector availability, and we need to be able to use uh, modern genome editing methods, um, uh, in, including homologous recombination, to be able to uh, leverage non-model microbes. And I'll note that, you know. I think it's attractive to attempt to move phenotypes into things like into organisms like E. coli and Saccharomyces, but but some phenotypes are incredibly hard to move, and so therefore, to me, I think uh, leveraging, for example, all the all the microbes that Mark and others are finding in the environmental uh, microbiology and biotechnology space is is really a, a massive opportunity for us as a community. And then I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk talk about sort of this you know this this synthetic biology sort of design build test learn cycle that um, you know I'm sure many of you uh, you know sort of think 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 about uh, applications in the space or think about you know uh, metabolic engineering and synthetic biology in the space and and to me I, I just wanted to point out you know perhaps some of the lessons that 
that I've seen over the last six or seven years working as part of uh, and a co-PI on this project, the Agile Biofoundry. Uh, this is led by uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Nathan Hilson is the overall PI for this project. It's a seven national lab consortium, uh, it's a US Department of Energy National Lab consortium. Uh, you can see the members here uh, on the map. And our, our, our focus is really about, you know, um, accelerating biomanufacturing. And, and what I have found at least is, you know, especially on the learn component of this, where I think is, you know, where the most opportunities really lie is, is and this is a picture from Hector Garcia Martin's paper in metabolic engineering earlier this year, which I really, I really agree with that we, we really get hung up on, you know, tool development and machine learning and deep learning and AI as approaches to predictions of non-intuitive, you know, modifications to microbes. Um, but frankly, I, to me, it's, it's, the most important piece of all of this is the least glamorous and that is, uh, but the most important for sure. And that is uh, automation and high throughput analytics, right? These, these are the things that tend to be completely neglected. Um, but we oftentimes, I think uh, in retrospect, uh, find at least certainly our, our lessons from, uh, uh, from our group that we, we, we tend to neglect these types of things, but frankly, they, they turn out to be in many cases, the most important. Uh, another thing that I, I, I suspect, um, you know, talking to a group of folks from the EU and the UK, and, and um, I, I think, frankly, uh, all of you do much better than, say, you know, uh, universities and um, education sort of um, uh, opportunities in North America, at least. Um, bioprocess development, at least in, in, in the US, tends to be quite neglected. And, and at least for me, uh, from my perspective, I have an incredibly hard time recruiting really good people who know how to run a bioreactor. <laughs> and so I think, you know, in, an, in the industrial biotechnology space, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of new systems coming online, like these integrated micro bioreactor systems, like the bioelectors, for example. Um, but, but frankly, I, I think we need an opportunity for us as, again, as a community is, is more training and bioprocess development. You know, it's, it's really fun and it's, it's more, you know, scientifically, uh, you know, I think uh, sexy to, to be engineering microbes, but pushing them in bioreactors uh, and pushing them hard towards tighter rates and yields that matter uh, and are, you know, will move the needle, I think is, is really critical. Uh, and, and, and frankly, and, and by doing so, we find where we can break the microbe, we can find new bottlenecks and we find new opportunities for metabolic engineering and synthetic biology by doing so. So I think this is a, the major opportunity. And then lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the process context. You know, this is, there's a lot, a lot going on in this slide. I, my, my apologies. This is a, a tape. These are tables from uh, Audrey Stratoff's paper in Current Opinion in Biotechnology uh, just uh, last year. And it just really shows, you know, in terms of, you know, recovering our target products, we, we usually have to fish them out of water or in some cases out of cells like PHAs or lipids, for example. And there are many technologies out there to do this, right? And so, um, you know, as shown and sort of illustrated here, and they utilize energy in, in different ways. And I think it's important to remember that DSP, downstream processing, can comprise, you know, something up to 90% of the minimum selling price for a bio-based chemical. And so not accounting for separations or not thinking through this when you start thinking about a new product is, is a sort of a, uh, a very dangerous path. And so I, I think it's important to consider separations in a holistic process, sort of start with the end in mind right at the beginning. Can you you know, find hosts that will make separations easier and cheaper and less energy intensive, for example. Things like off-target minor products, including media, can massively interfere with separations, uh, which, which salt you use to buffer or which acid or base you use to buffer, for example, also can, can have a massive uh, impact on separations. And, and, you know, there's a lot of steps that happen after a bioreactor oftentimes uh, when we're trying to fish a product out of water. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, and I'm almost done, Michael, my apologies, I'm running a little bit over, but um, uh, biology is always, not always the only answer. I, I think many of us know this, but I, I think it's important just to highlight it anyway. There are many opportunities to, you know, take biologically derived intermediates that are accessible at reasonable titer rates and yields, uh, and then expand uh, essentially the, the molecular scope that we can make from a bioproducts perspective using chemical catalysis. And, and, and this is a picture from uh, Brent Shanks and Jim Domestic's paper. And uh, this is a process flow diagram wherein we're able to take uh, three hydroxypropionic acid and make acrylonitrile catalytically, for example, downstream. And there's a lot of potential for combining uh, computational tools uh, that are focused on catalysis and chemistry uh, with computational metabolic engineering tools here. 
One thing that I always harp on that I, 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 uh, I think is important is it's never too early also to conduct analysis for industrial biotechnology applications, uh, including you know, even literally before metabolic engineering or synthetic biology efforts start. I think it's, it's important to at least consider this and there are many tools available to many of us to do so. Um, and then um, I'm gonna skip over this to go straight to the, to the last part. And so sort of around what molecules should we make and, and thinking about realistic, in this case, biofuels. Um, but I, th I think it's important to, to consider that, you know, aerobic versus anaerobic processes for biofuels, not bioproducts in this case, uh, comprise a completely different cost profile. Aerobic processes are in order of magnitude more expensive. Uh, their operating costs are, are quite substantially higher. Um, but anaerobic biology is incredibly good at producing small molecules at high yields. And, and many of them can be separated, you know, and made from yields, you know, greater than 75% of theoretical. Many of them, or several of them at least, have boiling points less than water to be able to separate, be separated through distillation. And many of them can be produced at, at, at titers that are appreciable. And then there's lots of ways to make various, you know, jet fuel, uh, marine fuel, diesel, uh, and gasoline type molecules. And so to me, I think biology will play a key role for cellulosic biofuels in intermediate production, not necessarily in fuel production. And I think, you know, there's molecules like terpenes look like fuels, but but you need to produce them typically aerobically, and their their theoretical yields overall from an energy and an atom efficiency perspective are quite low. And I think we as a field need to be realistic about this. And so, so that's what I have. Uh, all of our work is funded by DOE. So yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge them and of course all the folks who do all the work. I'm going to um, switch over immediately to the, the panel discussion and we'll have the chance, I think, to come back to some of the things you've said um, during your talk. So um, what I'd like to do first is to give um, Maria Pentila and Marion Crest uh, the opportunity to present themselves. So um, we'll start with um, Maria Pentila, please. Yeah. Hello, everybody. And thanks for the previous talks. And in a way, what Craig uh, presented, uh, that's uh, very much, of course, aligned to what, uh, what we do at uh, VTT also. I mean, the ideas which you presented are, <laughs> are very, uh, very clear. Uh, so I am a research professor in biotechnology at VTT, and VTT is a sort of applied research organization. We do a lot of work with industry. And then I'm also an adjunct, uh, adjunct professor at Aalto University in synthetic biology. So, so this probably tells, uh, in a way, my uh, where <laughs> which elements are in, in my CV. So, so in a way, what I could say, maybe looking at the history, is that, uh, that uh, it could be said that I, I've been, um, uh, I've been pursuing uh, the core of what is industrial biotechnology. And uh, that means that even though I, my background is molecular biology and uh, GMOs, uh, so it has always been related to a process and it always has been related also to, to, to quite complex raw materials. So it's not only glucose. So I would a little bit challenge what Mike said in the beginning about how you can disting distinguish these. And this means that, uh, that right from the beginning, uh, VTT and myself, we have been working with robust industrial organisms. That means uh, yeast for fermentation, various different uh, species, of course, and then also enzymes and enzyme production like then um, the whole hydrolytic enzymes for the reason that you need to hydrolyze the raw material. If we talk about uh, a sort of biomass uh, uh, based raw materials. So, and, and then uh, this is still highly relevant, all this. And then um, of course, I mean, uh, doing a sort of basic type of things, uh, VTT has been lots involved in the early days in the structure function of these enzymes, but right uh, when that was known, we also expressed the enzymes in yeast to have already at those times, maybe the consolidated processes and also then de developing uh, 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 fungal strains so that the enzyme can produce uh, produce and that partly has been the foundations for enzyme companies today and, and so on. And then just to take um, in a way an example, 
which I think also answers the questions that can one do in one organism or should one have several? So just the case which Greg mentioned, the, the second generation bioethanol. Uh, whatever the status is, how <clears throat> industries go, uh, go uh, along with that um, uh, in the future, but still that has been an excellent case in a way to understand what you can do within one organism to try, to try to make the process occurring, which is rather complex in terms of the raw material. So you need to understand what components are there, what sugars are there to know how the sugars are taken up, how they are converted further in the metabolism. You need to care about when you go to this anaerobic production, you need to care about the redox balances of the enzymes, engineer them. And finally, of course, you need to take care about, about the toxicity of the possible raw material when it's pre-treated. Pre and this, this all, in a way, you can do in one single organism. And then, of course, we have lots of other examples then then in a way what uh, the whole chemistry which you can uh, you, you can uh, you, you, you you can uh, you can do in in microbes and we know that that barely you barely get a drop but you can improve on productivity hundredfold maybe even even more i mean so that you really get industrial titers of these uh, uh, let's say small molecular compounds which greg, greg was was listing so um this is the potential, and uh, but still, and coming from VTT, where we also have thermochemical processes, we of course compete. I mean, what should be done from biomass? So, so the the efficiency of biotechnology is always uh, the question, and the overall process efficiency, starting from the raw material. Uh, at that level. And, and uh, so I think now I believe, like Greg said, that we really have now a possibility to for biotechnology, but we should also demonstrate that so that that biotechnology is one of the technologies where we can really use heterogeneous raw materials and funnel even all the components or most of the components in the raw material into a single product, even such which you need to really have in, 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 in pure format. And, and that is why, of course, there the whole synthetic biology toolbox uh, comes into place. And that is why, of course, also in Finland, so we have the synthetic powerhouse, we try to create a really sort of functional ecosystem uh, from teaching to, to then startup generation and also to, to have a transition in the big industries like pulp and paper energy industries so that they would take, take up uh, more bio, biotechnology. Uh, but it may be more difficult in country like Finland uh, where we have a certain history than in other countries, of course, US is, is so large in its um, activities that you, you, you have a diversity uh, of, in the playground you can play. But, uh, but I'm sort of advocating in a way that even with a single enzyme, taking the databases, doing um, high throughput, uh, uh, high throughput engineering, and also learning from that. You can you can really make uh, breakthroughs in biotechnology. Okay, thank you, Maria, for that introduction. So now I'll hand over to Marion, and Marion uh, will be bringing us um, a more industrial perspective. Yes. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. The keynotes were really inspiring me. So um, that's great. So just to introduce myself, my name is Marion Crest. I'm French. I work at the, the CIRCE, which is the main research and innovation center of a Suez company. I'm leading a team of researchers and uh, also managing the associated uh, experimental platforms that are dedicated to the treatment and the recovery of waste and effluents containing organic fractions have the chance to recently move from Paris to the south of France in, in Narbonne in a brand new building 
uh, and there, there we, we are starting our new research. Um, our, the, our main objectives are to improve and intensify the historical solutions uh, of organic weight and effluent treatment to limit their environmental impacts and also to explore and develop new solutions that will produce higher value from these residues. And so in this context, uh, really this, uh, this uh, workshop today is, is uh, very interesting for me. So maybe what I can do is to share with you some, some words on, on Suez activities in relation with environmental biotechnology. You may know that Suez is an international company providing environmental solutions, but its, uh, its business models has evolved a lot over the, the three last, last decades, decade. let's say. So historically, it provides sanitary services of drinkable water production and distribution and wastewater and waste collection and treatment. And so the historical objective was, of course, to treat the huge volumes and the tonnages by removing the contaminants and the undesirable compounds at the lowest cost for the community and without adding extra additional value, let's say. And so to handle these complex and variable streams, uh, we are used to design and operate biological processes that are using natural mixed cultures, uh, both in, anaerob in aerobic, anoxic, and anaerobic conditions. And so, for instance, we operate landfills, wastewater, wastewater treatment plants, soil remediation piles, composting plants, anaerobic digestion plants, and so on. And then a second layer of driver arrived uh, in, in our business model, which is to develop processes that will be safer, more compact, more efficient, uh, more environmental friendly, and also able to abate more complex contaminants, more complex pollution, specific contaminants, <clears throat> like for instance, micropollutants. And in this way, we started to look at specific microbes, specific microorganisms that will be able to, uh, to handle, to, to destroy, to remove uh, these specific contaminants. Like for, and also to, be, to live in very, very difficult environments, very salty with a lot of metals and so on. And finally, since I would say 15 years, um, the paradigm has shifted again towards the, the use of the residual streams as new resources. We have talked a lot about that just before, no? So we no more have to destroy, to, to degrade, to eliminate, to dispose of. We want to regenerate, to recycle, to recover, to use this organic carbon uh, to produce beneficial products for the society, no? So we are recycling secondary raw materials, we are producing alternative energy. We want to produce alternative fertilizers, biosource chemicals, and so on. And to do so, we, we need to have unitary processes that are very well integrated to combine both the functions of cleaning while delivering new products. We have to, we, we have to, to, to satisfy two types of customers, the waste producers and the new product uh, user. So that's where it became the concept of biofactories for the organic effluent and uh, environmental biorefineries for the organic waste and so on. And that's really on this topic that uh, I'm, I'm working today with my team. Um, and I would say that there is an ultimate evolution in Suez business model, which is to not only to treat, not only to, to, to recover, to produce new resources, new products, but to help in avoiding the production of solid, liquid, gaseous waste streams, and, and also to compensate their impact. And it's a totally different approach as a provider of environmental and digital, digital solutions. But here again, biotechnology, industrial biotechnology, environmental biotechnology can provide solutions. OK, thank you very much. And um, in fact, uh, what you've just said, Marion, gives me the opportunity to immediately come back to something that um, Marcus uh, said in his talk, where he said that um, environmental biotechnology was um, uh, increasingly, or maybe it was a prediction from Marcus, um, was increasingly moving from service 
orientated business to product orientated business and, and that's roughly what Marion has just said and I was wondering how will this um, affect um, uh, te the technology developments in the future this shift um, in expectations or um, so maybe Marcus you'd like to comment on that how, how you see things yes I think uh, for for part it's um, uh, <clears throat> So products which you can make, they, they are more or less directly related to ecological advantage for the organism. So it's almost always catabolic end products or something like that. And that uh, uh, you will not go and produce penicillin with um, uh, mixed cultures. That's, uh, but you can get a lot of inspiration from how natural organisms have solved some, some, some things. You might find specific enzymes or look at the variety. And very often, uh, the example of PHA's uh, regulation in the mixed cultures, it's essentially different than in most of the pure cultures, which have been isolated not on the PHA production capacity, but just on something else. <clears throat> and um, if you then see how engineers have tried to optimize PHA production in, in the standard, say, GMO uh, approaches by increasing production pathways and shutting down consumption pathways. It's a very different level of regulation than it's done in the natural organisms, which produce high amounts of PHA. So, and in that sense, it, it's, it's also an area to, to learn and to get inspiration how to do things. And I think that's even more important. And also maybe to find new catalytic enzymes with much higher functionalities. And theoretically, you can maybe come quite close to in the future to calculating and just designing the most optimal enzyme but i still think that if you can do this just by evolution you will get more or less the most optimal form in the end okay um another thing i'd like to bounce back on is um uh, in Greg's talk, he he mentioned that um, he was actually not going to talk too much about um, some of the new uh, tools uh, like CRISPR. But um, one thing that came up was um, uh, the the opportunities and and the and the sort of um, the interest of going towards non conventional microorganisms. And I was wondering, Maria, if you could comment on that um, with you know new engineering tools. Does it really open opportunities for? Um, uh, bringing in, you know, um, non-conventional microorganisms and, and exploiting them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, we have done quite a lot of, um, I don't know whether it's 20 different species, uh, fungal species, uh, using CRISPR and, and, uh, and noticing in a way that you can also uh, uh, make the transformation much more efficient efficient because some of the species are really something where it takes quite a lot of time to develop their genetic tools but if you then apply crispr to the species uh, so so then you you much more quicker get the strains to be engineerable and and also i mean our experience shows that that uh, that you can expand crispr to, to non-conventional strains, which have never been transformed um, before. So of course, I mean, there may be difficulties. We have, have had difficulties with algae, for instance, and, and so on. But, but in, 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 in general, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, nothing you should be afraid of, of thinking that uh, to, 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 develop, to develop those. And then you can also think about orthogonal systems, which work over species and, and help in, in strain engineering. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to move on to a question that came up in the chat. Um, and this question will be for Greg, I think, given his background. Um, it's about um, the role of mathematics in the future in these, in these fields. Um, my colleague Jean-Philippe Steyer would, want to, uh, would like to know what your views are on um, how you see the role of mathematics at the moment, you know, how you actually exploiting uh, mathematics right now and how do you see the development of this area in the future in, in industrial biotechnology? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, and, 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 and I'm, I'm sure that the others here have, have comments on this too, but um, <laughs> one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is we, we've hired uh, computer scientists as well as data scientists who come from sort of like um, image processing fields and things like this. Um, I, I have um, never been part of, or I'm not going to say that I'm an expert in this, but I've never been 
uh, I would say, sitting on the sidelines of a field that is moved so fast uh, as as data science, it is overwhelming. And then there's a there's probably a paper that comes out every day on this, or every you know certainly every week that is uh, completely changes the way we do things. And so, uh, to me, you know, bringing in physicists and mathematicians and uh, computer scientists and data scientists into um, especially to deal with uh, the glut of systems biology data that, you know, frankly, our, our human brains are not sufficiently able to, uh, <laughs> at least mine, uh, is not sufficiently able to uh, sift through and make non-intuitive predictions from, I think is just, I mean, just overwhelming opportunities there. So yeah, it's per perhaps a vague answer, but. Uh, okay, thank you. Well, uh, I read recently that um, uh, in the field, maybe maybe Marion or, or Marcus could comment on this. I read recently that in the field of um, um, environmental um, biotechnology and the study of microbial ecosystems, that um, actually the question of computer power is going to be seriously challenged because um, um, at the moment, if you want to make um, some quite complex um, modeling of the me uh, metabolic processes, you're going to be li limited to about 10 species. If you want to go beyond that, you, we will never have enough computer power. Um, is that true? And do you have any comments on or ideas of um, how we can nevertheless exploit the power of um, computing without um, having to invent uh, quantum computers tomorrow to deal with this? Yeah, I'm not a specialist in this, and my general approach is uh, to uh, uh, be more smart instead of uh, just crunching all the numbers, crunch those, uh, find ways to just use those numbers which are really relevant. That's mm -hmm. usually a small fraction of the total system, but that's uh, I'm, I'm not a data analyst who would probably say that I then miss a lot of opportunities. Okay. Are you using yeah. any of these approaches, Marion, in Suez? Yes, of course. Well, not very, very huge uh, um, com computing computer uh, sciences for now. Well, of course, we would like uh, we try to, to make a modeling of uh, of the, the, the different uh, biological pathways that uh, we are exploring, uh, in particular with bioelectrosynthesis. So I was not aware about this uh, this information you gave and the paper. But anyway, I, I think that generally speaking, the, the data science it will be a key enabler for, for the, the microbial, the, the, the mixed culture uh, understanding. Um, because for instance, with, with our very, very um, uh, variable flows of matters that we are handling, uh, we, we have to analyze a huge uh, number of non-repeatable observations. They are not repeatable because there is a huge diversity of parameters and conditions and, and to derive trends uh, from the noisy system to understand uh, the, the ecosystem uh, of microorganisms, I think that would be key. And um, and for me, maybe this advantage that will occur uh, in environmental biotechnology will be useful for the industrial biotechnology also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, I mean, when we when we talk about the complexity of systems and and having to handle these and analy analyze them, I. I uh, the phrase that comes to my mind is that there's um, the safety in large numbers, but maybe simplicity in small numbers. So um, this, this maybe sums up the, the two the two approaches to biotechnology. Um, but seriously, um, there's another question uh, in the chat that's come up um, about um, how do you perceive um, future um, difficulties related to regulation. So if we want to exploit more and more resources and move more and more towards the use of um, waste resources, how do you see the difficulties related to regulation, especially if we're moving from services to products? Um, so I don't know who would like to comment on that. Uh, Marion maybe, because that's the core of your, yeah. uh, your area. Yeah, well, yeah. Typically this is our first driver, the social acceptance and, and the regulatory framework. And, and finally, it all depends. It depends a lot on the culture, the different countries. That's very interesting to work in an international company because finally we can, we sometimes we are able to, to, to develop solutions that are acceptable in a place and not in another. So that's quite uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, so finally, of course, we, we all, always have to focus on, on, on the precautionary principle. Um, and 
finally, what we see is that there is like a hierarchy in terms of, um, of types of matters, of, 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 room, of, well, of, of waste, let's say. It seems that uh, there are more noble matters, like the, the residues that comes from agriculture, all the vegetal residues, the uh, food and bev residues, they are seen more noble, they are more well accepted by the society as new products. Um, whereas when you go to post-consumer matters, uh, like food waste that has been touched by the people or, or well, sewage sludge, the worst, uh, then people are very reluctant, it's disgusting, it's hazardous, there are a lot of pathogens, so they don't want to see that come into new products. And what Mark explained, with uh, the, the, all the development with the PHA is really fascinating because it's, it means that we are able to, to, to transform such kind of, such kind of, of, uh, of uh, residues, material, disgusting matter into something that can be accepted and, and put in the market with a value. And that's the, um, the main objective, the main difficulty. And of course, the regulatory framework has to evolve with its new developments. And that's why we have to also to publish, prove, demonstrate the inequity, show the benefits, environmental, social, economic benefit altogether to, to have the regulation being uh, changed. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Maria, go ahead. I had a comment here, and this is a question for Mark, because we just uh, not only have the sort of, uh, let's say, toxicity issues or acceptance issues or GMO issues, but then we also now have the, the single-use plastics uh, directive. So whether Mark's PHP falls under that or not, we don't need to go into that. But, but there are lots of things which I think we as community should really be uh, putting our act together to, to try to demonstrate how useful uh, the things are which we can make. And, and PHP, of course, is one example. And now it falls under plastics. So it's not acceptable. I don't know all the details, but um, Mark probably needs uh, or uh, knows knows that. But the, just one comment more into this uh, this uh, this frame. Yeah, maybe two two aspects here. Uh, for me, the the public access acceptance that if you design something, that's one of the boundary conditions. That's that's just simple. You have to think about who is going to use your product and, and uh, will it fit or not, or that's, um, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's part of the equation. Um, the, the whole legislation, that's a way more complex system, which is totally um, full of people who don't understand anything. I say then, of course, as, a, as an engineer, but like the PHA issue, that the EU has said that PHA is not, not a natural polymer and therefore is not a uh, bioplastic. So I don't understand the reasoning, uh, but they say it's not the natural polymer. That's uh, um, there's people in, and this Camera, we have a similar problem because the whole legislation for polymers is assuming that a polymer is consisting about a set of repeating units, which is true if you have polyethylene, which is probably still true if you have uh, alginate, but even there the repeating units are not standard. That, and the same for PHB, it's a mixture of PHB, PHB, and the repeating units are random and not standard. Uh, by Chimera, which is a kind of like a protein, it's even more complicated because it's certainly not a repeating unit except the one half million Dalton big polymer itself, which is then repeating, but um, it doesn't fit in, 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 in the legislation simply because people have not been thinking about it. Overall, on the other side, I think that if you do not try to say if you recover PHA, um, so if coming from food waste, from food waste, try to produce the product before it becomes waste, then you don't have already the problem with the waste status. Um, but once it's waste, you have the problem with the waste status, which is correct. Uh, it, it's also good that there is a good control on converting waste back in something into society. But that's, um, yeah, that, that's then more complicated, but there it usually works once you know where the product goes. So if we are with Carmira, just saying, okay, we extract polymers from wastewater and we want to bring this on the market, you have a much more difficult situation than we say, no, we, we extract Carmira and now we want to bring this um, non-flammability coating, which we want to 
to use in construction on the market and we uh, regulate the non-claimability coating because then we know exactly what we're doing so the, the, there is a way around it but then you first need to have product and it's not always that easy to balance that okay and sometimes we have an advantage because like for the camera now we have a quite good market because the eu um, uh, has a regulation that in the seed coating and in the fertilizer coating palletization you're not allowed anymore to use polyurethanes and other um, polymers which are non-biodegradable and P and Calmira does the same job can replace it so that that's straightforward already there we have again a strange way because if you would bring the sludge right away to the land in most countries in Europe we can apply it right away on the land if we extract the Calmira and we only bring the Calmira on the land um, it's not it's not allowed that's uh, uh, so we make a cleaner product to the land, but then it's certainly not allowed anymore. So this kind of that's where the regulator is always a bit a pain in the ass to, yeah, to get I things done. Just, just wanted to say that we have several things we we should together. I I, I guess uh, sort of try to work yes. on influence in the continuation. Yeah, yeah but I, I think as soon as that you have a good product and PHA is not a product and Chimera is not a product and recovered phosphate is not a product, you need. The end product as soon as you have that i think it's not that complicated it's the problem that we want as early as possible in the value chain to convert waste back into products okay since we're pressed for time i'd like to switch to another subject and it, it turns out that um it's it's also a subject that's asked in the chat um so far we talked about um pure cultures we talked about mixed cultures we didn't we, um uh, quite complex mixed cultures. We didn't talk about more simplified um, um, species associations. And in the chat, there's a question about really what come, boils down to division of labor. Uh, Greg, you talked about um, some of these complex um, metabolic pathways. Um, and you were saying that, you know, some of them can be incredibly complex. Um, have you any experience or have you considered um, um, making systems, let's say with two, two microorganisms where you can split the labor and split the pathway between two microorganisms? At least in the flavonoid production space, you know, there are multiple groups that have used um, yeast and E. coli together. Um, probably Maria knows more, way more about that than I do, but, um, but certainly in the context of actually on, on substrates, we use, we use um, you know, two, uh, component systems all the time when it comes to uh, being able to uh, assimilate various substrates. And that's where we use two system, you know, sort of two, in, in our cases, bacterial systems simultaneously. Uh, sometimes getting them to play together nicely is really challenging and being able to control the content of, yeah, the composition of those, even just sort of um, two component cultures is, is quite challenging. So uh, I will stop there, but yeah. Okay, anybody wants to comment on that? I think this is a point where uh, the, there is a bit development in resource allocation theory and, and other things, but this sharing of pathways and how to do that, that's, I think, an intriguing aspect for microbiology to understand when it's useful or not to, to separate pathways. And there are quite nice examples, like in the nitrification, the traditional, it's separated, ammonium oxidation and nitrite oxidation now recently organisms have found which do the whole pathway at once and each has their own ecological role. In the denitrification, there's four denitrification enzymes and also there, you have organisms which do the whole pathway, you have organisms which do parts of the pathway and obviously there are conditions which, I, well, I can speculate but not, and no good rules to understand why under which conditions would, or would it be advantage or disadvantage to share pathways and to, uh, to develop that. And, um, that would need some theoretical development of concepts to be able to, to get a better predictions than and getting out of the anecdotal um, uh, arena. Okay. Maria, did you want to make a comment? Uh, just uh, briefly that, yes, I think it comes to the energetics. Uh, for me, it comes to the whether you can, you can divide the energetics of making the compounds and then uh, it comes also very much to the overall process yields and, and how much actually you produce a product over how much you produce biomass. And there are some uh, um, concepts, but sometimes they have, uh, let's say, false thinking. They don't take something into 
consideration, but if you could really have a very neat, neat sort of synthetic design where the two organisms are really made uh, codependent and also thinking that you can build a process upon those. So th that concept. So then, of course, but I mean, I think it's still very early days to see the re really workable concepts. So they are more sort of just um, nice ideas. Okay, maybe the last word for this panel discussion will be for Marion. Uh, it's just to know, um, really, um, uh, are these are these um, concepts uh, um, things that are attracting the attention of um, industry like Suez, or, or uh, is it, as Maria just said, still very too far fetched to be anywhere near uh, meriting uh, your attention? I think that in some in some systems that we are looking at very closely, like for bioelectrosynthesis. Uh, we, we are interested in co-cultures at the yeah. at, in the cells where there is a synthesis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I propose we wrap up the panel discussion. So thanks very much for being really efficient and 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 dealing with the questions.